Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our Balance Your Hormones, Balance Your Life webinar with Dr. Marcia A. Harris here at Patients Medical in New York City. My name is Megan Franzen, and I'm going to play host today, but the real star of the show here is Dr. Harris. She is an expert in balancing both women and men's hormones here at our Holistic Medical Center in Midtown Manhattan. And um, Dr. Harris, we're so excited you can join us today. Well, thank you so much, Megan. I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Um, so first I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about Patients Medical and who we are. We're a full-service holistic medical center in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, we integrate modern medicine with holistic practices. And we're located right here on 2nd Avenue between 42nd and 43rd Street. And if you all are uh, familiar with New York City territory, we're kind of between Grand Central Terminal and the UN um, on the east side of Manhattan. Very, very centrally located. Our doctors promote healing and prevent disease. That really is their mission. Um, they focus on the root cause of symptoms, and they avoid any sort of a Band-Aid type cure. So they really look deeper into what's going on besides the, okay, what's the matter? Here's a prescription, which we all know has definitely some issues. And we're going to get you know, more into that later, but uh, you know, that's kind of the MO of patients' medical is really spend time with the patient and understand what's going on and address the root cause of what's causing the symptoms. I believe that patient's medical actually defines integrative medicine. We take the conventional medical protocols and the, very, uh, the best of modern medicine that really works for patients well with the sensibilities of holistic medicine and brings them together to give a very comprehensive patient experience and a wide variety of protocols to suit each patient to a T. So we have Dr. Marcia A. Harris, as I mentioned. She's a holistic gynecologist and anti-aging medicine doctor. She received her MD from Columbia and was awarded the Rudin Scholarship. She did her internship in internal medicine at Harlem Hospital Center, residency in OBGYN at New York Hospital while Cornell, and postgraduate training at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. Say that five times fast. <laughs> she has over 37 years of experience and um, a lot of passion for the subject, I, I must say. Um, here at Patients Medical, her specialties include, but are not limited to by any means, hormone balancing, nutrition, detoxification, weight loss, IV therapy, neuropathy, thyroid balancing, feminine wellness, pain management, anti-aging medicine. And let me tell you, this is a doctor who really walks her talk. She's not just sitting from some ivory tower and telling patients what to do. She's actually lived through these experiences that most of her patients have come through um, uh, and really seeking her help. So she doesn't just tell them what to do. She can speak from experience of what works and what doesn't. So without further ado, Dr. Harris, tell us a little bit about how we can balance our hormones so we can balance our life. And what does that mean? Well, thank you, Megan. Uh, everybody, normal is very important in order to know what's abnormal, mm -hmm. right? And in life, as in health, normal is defined by cycles, balance, and transitions. Mm -hmm. The seasons, summer, fall, winter, spring, depicts the cycles. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And balance is... You know, we know that in the summer it's going to be hot, and in the winter it's going to be cold. Mm -hmm. We also I think know, for some parts of the well, United States. <laughs> uh, in, in the old days, yes. right now it's all messed up. But, in New York. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the difference between the cycles are all marked by transitions. Mm -hmm. And as it is in nature, so it is in our body. Mm. So it is actually in health. Mm. And what happens is, especially with the female, with the male as well, but, you know, concentrating right this minute anyway on the female, 
And what happens is to go from one cycle to the next. And when you get there, it's going to even out and be balanced, but the transition usually is very, very rocky. Mm -hmm. As anyone who's had a pubertal female child mm -hmm. or dealt with a menopausal or perimenopausal woman <laughs> can attest to. And I'm guessing that the perimenopausal or menopausal women are the bulk of the people who are listening to us right now. Yes, absolutely. So, let, why does this happen? Let's talk about our hormone function. And the, the main hormones are progesterone, estrogen, and testosterone. Now, most people don't know this, but our hormones are really necessary for just about everything to function in the body. Really? So it's not just reproduction? It's not just reproduction. Our hormones actually have more than 400 functions in the body. And when the hormones are not balanced and the hormones are lacking, there actually is a consequence and a lot of times that consequence actually leads to disease. Mm, okay, so important to have these uh, hormones balanced. It is very important to have these hormones balanced. Now, as I just said, there are three main hormones. There are hundreds of hormones, literally. But there are three main ones. And most of us know of about maybe 10 or 12, you know, thyroid hormone, DHEA, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, androstene, dione. I mean, I can keep on going. Our focus today are going to be on the hormones that are related to sexual functioning and that type of thing. So let's first talk about the two main female hormones, which are estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen is the first uniquely female hormone. It is considered the male, the main female hormone. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are about 15 different estrogens. Wow. Literally. So there's but not just estrogen. There's an array of estrogens. There's an array of estrogens. There are, however, three main ones. Three main ones. And those are the ones we're going to um, concentrate on today. Now, xenoestrogens are very important in the society in which we live today because we are exposed to these estrogen-like compounds on a regular basis. And phytoestrogens are important for this talk and this webinar because that's where we're going with this. It, in other words, when the body stops making the hormone that it normally makes, we can actually replace it with phytoestrogens. That's good news. Yes, it is. Now, the three main estrogens, it's very important that I break them down because um, they're different. They have different functions and different side, of, you know, side effects and different um, things that they actually cause and do. And the main uh, estrogens are E1, E2, and E3. Estrone, estradiol, and estriol. Aptly named. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, estrone is actually made in the fat tissue. And it's very important that we know about estrone because estrone is the bad estrogen. That's the one that causes cancer. Mm. It, has, it really does have cancer-causing properties. Estradiol is mainly made in the ovary, and that's the worker estrogen. That's the one, really, that does what the hormone does, you know, to our body. And it's the one that's active and the one that actually relieves the symptoms. Estriol actually is the weakest one. It doesn't help much with symptoms. However, most of the estrogen, the, of all the 12 or more estrogens that we have, most of it is estriol. Okay. 
Okay, good. So now we've got all of that sorted out. Where do they fit? Well, as I said, estriol is uh, most, most of the time, okay, and especially premenopausally, okay, it is up to 80% of the estrogen that is produced. Estradiol is 10 to 20%, and estrone is 10 to 20%. Now, if you look at the graph that you're, look, that you're seeing, postmenopausally, you'll notice that it flips around, and estrone, which is the bad one, is the one that is most prevalent. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so that's without, that's just naturally. That's naturally, okay. yes. Now, what is the function of estrogen? Estrogen has multiple functions, but the ones that we're going to focus on today are the ones that are related to us being women. Mm -hmm. And that is regrowth of the menstrual tissue, growth of the follicle into an egg, growth of the breast. Estrogens actually support the vaginal tissue, keeps it moist, keeps it young. Mm -hmm. And it's very critical and crucial in the development of our sex characteristics. It decreases thyroid hormone, and it stores fat. I wonder where we've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> Estrogen actually stores fat. I see. So the pieces are starting to kind of fall together about why postmenopausal women have this excess of uh, estrogen. Yeah, right? In the wrong places. <laughs> <laughs> now, excess estrogen causes several things, and I want everybody to look at this list and remember it. Breast tenderness, depression, fatigue, poor concentration, fibrocystic breasts, PMS, which I like to call pretty mean sister. <laughs> Not premenstrual syndrome, but pretty mean sister. Fibroids and endometriosis are diseases which are associated with excess estrogen. Water retention and bloating. And as we said before, fat gain around the hips and thighs, as well as predisposes to breast and uterine cancer. All right, now everybody take a good look because there will be a quiz a little bit later. <laughs> now, progesterone is the second uniquely female hormone. And progesterone is specifically made by the ovary but after ovulation. Okay? Now, it also can be made from wild yam and soybeans. Okay? And I want to caution everybody out there that Provera, which is the name I'm sure you've all heard, and Depo-Provera are not progesterone. And this becomes evident why this is so important for you to know that later in the presentation. Now, what are the functions of progesterone? Like the name says, progestation. Progesterone is what supports and promotes the development of the fertilized egg. It is also a natural diuretic, okay? It uses fat for energy. Anybody getting a, a picture here? <laughs> I like progesterone better than estrogen already. <laughs> okay. It is a natural antidepressant. It really does have a calming effect. And it also restores the sex drive. It promotes regular sleep patterns and very important, it protects against cancer. In essence, it balances estrogen. What I usually say is estrogen promotes growth. Progesterone promotes balance. Mm. Progesterone promotes development. If you have growth without development, there is a problem. Absolutely. Now, what does progesterone deficiency cause? Breast tenderness, depression, fatigue, poor concentration, 
fibroids and endometriosis, fibrocystic breasts, PMS or pretty mean sister, water retention and bloating, fat gain around the hips and thighs, as well as breast and uterine cancer. This sounds vaguely familiar. It doesn't. <laughs> it should sound quite familiar because it's the exact list. That's what I mean when I talk about balance. Estro too much estrogen is just as bad or causes the same symptoms as too little progesterone. Life is about balance. Mm. Now, I want everybody to take a good look at these diagrams. There are four uh, demarcations here. The first is a picture with a cross-section of the uterus, the tubes, and the ovaries. The second is a graph, and you will see it's labeled. The red line is estrogen, and the blue line is progesterone. The third is a depiction of what actually happens in the ovary. So first we have the anatomical structures, then we have a graph of what happens to the hormones in the blood on a monthly basis as it is excreted. The third is what happens in the ovary on a monthly basis. And the fourth is a depiction of what happens in the uterus. That is actually a depiction of the uterine lining. And that, ladies and gentlemen, actually is an exact lineup of what happens. So at any point in time that you drop a vertical line, you will be able to tell what happens anatomically in the blood, in the ovary, and in the uterus. And just to, to show you a little bit um, what happens, the ovary starts out, um, the follicle actually starts out very small. It starts developing. And when it gets halfway there, in response to what happens with the blood, in response to what happens with the blood, it ruptures the follicle, and you can see what happens with what's called the, the progesterone goes all the way up, the estrogen comes down, and at the same time, the corpus luteum, so-called, which is the ruptured follicle, the corpus, okay, after the luteinizing hormone has worked on it. And that's what happens. You get a mature corpus luteum, okay, which if it's not fertilized, then degenerates and the process starts all over again. And you can see uh, the correlation with what happens in the uterine lining. It starts out very, very thin after menstruation, and then as the follicle develops, it gets thicker and thicker, and the, the vessels get more tortuous, and the, the crypts get deeper and bigger. And then once you ovulate, it goes really crazy, gets really thick, and again, if, it's, if it, the corpus luteum is fertilized, then the egg implants in this nice thick bed and it continues throughout the pregnancy. If it doesn't, it degenerates. Menstruation happens because it sheds, and the process starts all over again. Just like that. <laughs> so complex. And, you know, you, we women, every month we say, oh, my gosh, I got my period again. But there's so much going on inside. Very intricate process. Yes, it is. Now, this is um, a better graph, actually, of um, what we tried to show you before, because this actually is, is more, more like what happens, um, in that the progesterone really does peak, peak. It goes really high. It's low at the beginning of the menstrual cycle, and then in response to the corpus luteum and the follicle erupting and being shed, it really peaks and then drops back down. So, as we age, the ovaries produce less hormones. And just as with puberty, when a female goes from being a kid 
to an adult, there's turbulence, the reproductive years, the same thing happens. You get the estrogen, the progesterone, and the testosterone in optimum balance. That gives us high energy, strong sex drive. And with the transition to menopause, that is perimenopause, we get estrogen dominance symptoms such as we described before and go into menopause. Now what exactly is menopause? Menopause is the permanent cessation of menstruation. In other words, that cycle stops and it's actually caused by the decreased production of the ovarian hormones. It most commonly occurs between ages 48 and 52. Actually, anything over 40 is not abnormal. We're not worried about. Uh, before 40, we call it premature menopause, and we go looking for reasons. After 40, it's fine. Um, the average age, however, is about 51. Now, it's important to note that menopause is not a disease. Menopause is a natural transition from one life cycle to another. Now, it seems like um, many products and advertisers would have you believe otherwise. Well, <laughs> that's why I'm emphasizing it. <laughs> okay. Now, um, back to that other slide, uh, Megan. The last two things there says progesterone falls disproportionately greater and this creates estrogen dominance. And this is important because most people think of menopause as an estrogen deficient or an estrogen deficiency condition. It is not. It really isn't. It's a progesterone deficiency, mm, which makes more estrogen be available. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, that's very important. Very important distinction. Now, what are the symptoms? Aha! Take a look. Does anybody here recognize themselves in any of these things? <laughs> and I tell you, this is not a complete list. Mood swings, depression, panic attacks, bloating, gas, osteoporosis, varicose veins, weight gain, chronic fatigue, erectile dysfunction, vaginal dryness, palpitations, difficulty sleeping, urinary leakage, creepy crawly skin. I mean... All of the above. Now, menopause, as I said before, is not an estrogen deficiency condition because our exposure to estrogen is unchanged. Now, a lot of women will have what we call vasomotor symptoms or hot flashes. And if you were to do nothing, nine times out of ten, those would diminish anyway. However, the basic underlying reason and cause is still there, and that's important. Now, initially at least, treatment with natural progesterone is effective in most women, okay? However, you don't get the advantages of exogenous replacement. Now. And just for the, the listeners here, exogenous replacement, can you define that? Oh, give what we give you. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, a lot of people will say, well, how, you know, when did we start hearing about this and when did we start noticing that um, these things are happening, when did we start treating this? This goes, believe it or not, back to the 1930s. Okay, as far back as the 1930s, in the late 1930s, was when the sex hormones were actually isolated. Okay, and sharing plow pharmaceuticals way back then was instrumental in um, sponsoring this work that was done. Now, again, in the late 1930s, um, the hormone diethylstilbestrol which is a synthetic estrogen, was given to pregnant women to prevent miscarriages. And they started noticing that 9 out of 10 female babies 
of women who took DES had genetic abnormalities. Mm. Okay, now remember, I said it was a synthetic estrogen. Five out of ten, when they grew up, were not able to conceive. And two out of ten actually ended up having cancer of the vagina. And in men, testicular cancer. In the 40s, um, it was noted that estrogen was a very important factor in carcinogenesis as far back as the 40s. And Wyatt Ayrst in 1942 came out with Premarin, made from pregnant mare's uterine. Urine, sorry. Pregnant mare's urine. And that is still the number one prescribed estrogen. Now, Dr. Harris, pregnant mare's urine, that is shocking. Well, they didn't try to hide it. pre ma <laughs> Right. I, I'm not sure how many people actually extrapolated that from that, but yes, very, very shocking. Most of the time that I speak and I say that, most people in the room, you know, go, oh, my goodness, mm -hmm. because most people don't understand and realize that, mm -hmm. that what they're popping, the pills they're popping every day, really is coming from horse's urine. <laughs> that doesn't sound good at all, but I'm well, sure you're going to tell us why. <laughs> I am going to tell you why. In the 1970s, Premarin was declared the gold standard. In 1971, the FDA actually revoked the approval of DES. I mean, there were enough studies and enough uh, of a mess that it had caused, and they knew this from all the studies, that they actually took it off the market. They took the ES off the market. Now, by 1975, it was obvious that the endometrial cancer rate was directly related to getting this estrogen. And what they did was they, they talked about it, they looked at the studies, and they said, okay, unopposed estrogen, especially with what we had at the time, which was pregnant mare's urine, gave cancer, or led to cancer. So you figure they would have taken it off the market. But no, instead of taking it off the market, some smart guy at one of the um, pharmaceutical companies, and it actually was why it's theirs, mm -hmm. said, no, don't take it off the market. Let's just give something to oppose it. And that's what they did. So instead of taking the Premarin off the market, they did a synthetic progesterone. It's not progesterone. It's a progestin because it's synthetic. But they gave that to oppose the estrogen. And I tell you, instead of becoming safer, it was actually more dangerous. But you know what? They were counteracting it, and they were making money. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, fast forward to our time. The Women's Health Initiative study, which I'm sure most people have heard about, in 1993 was commissioned to figure out what was going on with the hormone replacement. And they had 17,000 healthy women between the ages of 55 and 79. Now, I'll say most of the women were in their 60s, mm -hmm. most of the women. There were a few women in the 50s and a few women in the 70s. Most of the women were in their 60s. And so most of them passed menopause already. Most of them were not only past menopause, but way past menopause, <laughs> 5, 8, 10 years mm -hmm. past menopause which again becomes significant down the road. Also significant, they all had a uterus, okay, and what they were trying to figure out was not did, did it work for menopausal symptoms. That was an assumption up front. What they were trying to figure out was did this or could this really help heart disease and hip fracture. Now, something I didn't say earlier when we talked about this, our hormones actually protect us. Our hormones are actually protected to a certain extent, our natural hormones, especially the female hormones on the female, okay? If you'll notice, 
men start getting heart attacks and strokes and the sequela from that type of thing much earlier, like in their 40s, whereas women don't start getting that till their late 50s and 60s. Why? Because we have the advantage of the hormonal protection. Okay? So, again, we know this. The question was, do the hormones, the exogenous hormones, the hormones that we were giving, the horse's urine stuff, did it really help? Okay? Now, the study was not designed to address the benefits for the treatment of menopausal symptoms. Uh, there were three arms to the study. One set of the women got only estrogen, and CEE is conjugated equine estrogen, yes, equine, as in horse's urine stuff. The second set of women got the CEE, but with a progestin, medroxyprogesterone acetate, which is a progestin. And the third set of women got a sugar pill. Okay, now, the Premarin-only arm of the study showed a decreased risk in hip fracture and colon cancer. However, in 2002, they stopped the study for several reasons, not the main ones being. 35% of the initially enrolled women dropped out. 20% dropped out because of side effects and fear. But also, in July of the same year, the study was halted way before they had planned to stop it because the numbers were staggering. And ladies and gentlemen, look at these numbers. There was a 22% increase in total cardiovascular disease. There was a 26% increase in breast cancer. 29% increase in heart attacks. There was, there was a 33% decrease in hip fractures and a 30% decrease, 37% decrease in colorectal cancer. But there was a 41% increase in strokes, a 60% increase in blood clots, and a 200% increase in Alzheimer's and dementia. And that's shattering right there. The, just the thought that these women experienced that. Um, it's amazing. So here, you know, they got some relief for some of their symptoms, but then they ended up not knowing who they were. Not good. Not good. So now, you know, recently, actually just earlier this week, so we're talking um, October of 2013 that we're in right now, earlier this week, um, more breaking news about the WHI came out. And I was, I was surprised that this is still news because I thought we were done with all of that. But um, can you talk a little bit about this, the breaking news about, you know, oh, the, um, the WHI said that um, the, they're basically reaffirming um, some of the things that they already knew. Well, basically what they did, even though they stopped the study, they continued following the women. Okay. Okay, that's what actually happened. And what it what it did was it proved that their original uh, premise mm -hmm. and what happened originally and why they stopped it originally was real. That's what it did. Mm -hmm. They tried to see if down the line, even though they stopped giving the women the meds, that yes, it was indeed protective and, you know, but it, it proved that no, it was not. All right, just reaffirming. <laughs> Basically reaffirming, yes. Good to understand that. Yes. Now, going back and then um, the, around the same time as the Women's Health Initiative study, there was a Swedish study which showed that with Prempro, which is the estrogen, the Premarin, the pregnant mare's urine, and the progestin, 
women on that combination, there was a 54% increase in ovarian cancer, okay, and a 43% increase in ovarian cancer on women, in women with estrogen alone. Interestingly enough, in the Swedish study, there was no improvement in most of the quality of life issues. Now remember I said they didn't even look at the quality of life issues in the American study. They just made an assumption that it really did help with the things that they said it helped with. So, do we have options? Gosh, I hope so, because it doesn't sound too good so far. <laughs> Fortunately, we do. Now, options start with herbal remedies. And remember I said earlier we're going to come back to phytoestrogens. There are estrogens in plants. There are estrogens out there um, which are used and have been used for a long time. Okay for the symptoms. The problem with this, and you'll see the list here of, of, of the things that, that I'm talking about, dietary soy, flaxseed, wild yam, black cohosh, etc. Okay, the problem with this is that these actually relieve the symptoms, but they do not fix the problems. Remember Megan said initially that a patient's medical we try to get to not only the root cause, but we try to not put band-aids on open sores. We try to fix the problems. Okay, so herbal remedies really basically don't work that well, and that is because biochemically the body is not set up, okay, to get the plant hormones into the form that it needs to get to the cell. So you, you eat it, okay, but the body can't make the transition, cannot convert it adequately. So, you know, it, it might help with the symptoms a little bit, but that's it. Sounds better than pregnant Mary's urine, but still um, not quite what we're looking for. That is correct. So, where does that leave us? That actually leaves us with what we call bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, BHRT. And people have a lot of questions. BHRT has been clinically proven to be safe, effective. It replaces the hormone deficiency, so it does what we tell you it does. And biochemically, it actually resolves the problem at the cellular level. That sounds much better. It sure is. Now, what is bioidentical hormone replacement therapy? This is made from um, soy and wild yam. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> no Mary urine. And it, the structure is identical. What is extracted from the edamame and the wild yam is identical. It's diastgenin, which is absolutely identical. Overwhelming research, okay, shows that this not only has fewer side effects, but is perfectly safe and gives the best result. Now, how and why is that important? Okay, uh, the, the structure, uh, let's say use, using my hand, for example, or the key, uh, as you see here, um, the key fits the lock, okay? Um, it's exactly the same structure, exactly the same, all right? And at a cellular level, the body recognizes, accepts, and uses BHRT just as it would human hormones. And that's important, ladies and gentlemen. So. We can we have a choice, synthetic hormones from pregnant mare's urine or compounded hormones that are identical to what our bodies produce. Now, what is synthetic? Synthetic is chemically altered, patentable, 
<laughs> is that such a word? I have no clue. But it is now. One of the problems is that because um, the this, this stuff that is taken out of the, the yam and the soy cannot be patented, okay, because stuff that's found in nature cannot be patented. Okay, now, why is chemical structure important? If you look at these two graphs, you don't have to have been a chemistry major to see that there's a difference. And the body makes and recognizes the structure on the left. And if you look at the structure on the right, the things hanging off it are different. And the body doesn't recognize. So just to uh, kind of drill down a little bit more, so when we're talking about this, this is our body's own progesterone that, that we're looking correct. at on the left here. And on the right, is this the progestin that, that you were correct. talking about before? That is progestin. Okay. That is synthetic progesterone, medroxyprogesterone acetate, so which is Provera, Depo-Provera, mm -hmm. progestin. Mm -hmm. It is totally different, and the body doesn't recognize. Right, understandably. So here we go again. Now, now look at the two top ones. The one on the left is estradiol, as is made by the body. And you can see where the structures are similar. But again, you don't have to have been a chemistry major comparing it to the one under it to see that it's totally different. Now, equiline is what they extract from the horses, OK? It's different. Look at the two bottom ones, testosterone on the left. That's what our bodies make. Look at methyl testosterone. Okay? It's different. So, natural hormones, bioequivalent hormones, bioidentical hormones are available as extracted from plant sources. And they're available for use in patches or creams or gels or sprays or pellets. Now, why do we have a problem with giving it orally? Well, they, I just suppose first that people may not know that there's a problem with giving it orally, but apparently there is, yes? There is a problem with giving it orally. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, number one, there is a roller coaster effect. I'm trying to figure out how to say this. Mm -hmm. There's a peak and trough daily. Mm -hmm. Okay? When you take it and it all gets absorbed, it goes way, way up. And then it comes down, comes down, comes down, and then crashes. You crash and burn. Okay? But in the meantime, okay, it gets and is metabolized by the liver. Okay? And there are some bad things that happen in the liver to these hormones, which make them really bad for us. Mm. Okay? Not effective. No. Now, better than oral, much better than oral, is the transdermal approach. And this can be as patches or creams or gels, okay? Because, number one, it doesn't have to go through the liver. So all the bad things that happen, like where it affects the heart and that type of thing, doesn't happen, okay? However, you still get the peaks and troughs because you've got to put it on. It goes straight into the bloodstream, and that's good, but it goes way, way up, and then you get less, 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 and then you crash and burn anyway, and you've got to start the process all over again. There is a problem with contamination in terms of it rubbing off on your spouse or kids or in gym equipment, okay? And it even loses um, efficacy over time because what happens is the body, what picks it up in the body are called receptors. And when you keep putting it in the same place every day, and it's put in the fatty areas, you know, under the arms and under the breasts and and the inner thighs, and even on the buttocks. And what happens is the receptors get saturated. So it st st stops working, basically. Works less and less 
efficiently, even before the crash and burn, mm. as you keep doing it. All right. There's got to be a better way. Is that there what you think? Is. <laughs> there is. And I talked about uh, patches again. That's just mm -hmm. another way of um, giving it. And injections. Injections are interesting because it gives good symptom relief. Okay. But again, number one, it can be toxic. Number two, the peaks and troughs are not as frequent. You don't have to do it two, three times a day, but you still get the peaks and troughs, whether it's weekly or monthly, but you still get the peaks and troughs. When it's injected. When it's mm -hmm. injected, yes. Okay. So, based on the route of administration, what is the best method? The best method is pellet therapy. Now, people will look at me and say, but why didn't my doctor know about this? Or why haven't, isn't this more well-known or publicized or whatever? Well, it goes back to the 1930s. It goes back to the same time. This was all discovered right around the same time. The problem is, because it's natural and cannot be patented, there was no interest whatever in developing it. So it's been used for the same amount of time, but there was no interest in developing it. Okay. The advantages to this route of administration is that, number one, there is no liver bypass. So you don't increase your clotting factors. You do not increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. As a matter of fact, it's thought to be protective against cardiovascular disease. Very importantly, there is no peak and trough effects. Because what happens is, because it's implanted, it's there. And your body uses it as it needs it. Okay. There is one slight downside, and that is breakthrough bleeding. Women who still have their uteruses can bleed if the progesterone to estrogen ratio is not adequate. Mm, I understand. Okay. Okay. Now, this shows what I'm trying to describe in terms of the roller coaster effect. And I'm sure you can figure out which is which. <laughs> okay. The oral administration peaks, crash and burn, peaks, crash and burn, peaks, crash and burn, okay. The patches are longer, okay. It's, it's longer, but then you crash and burn anyway, okay. And as you can see, the implant is a steady, steady state. So the ratio of the the two estrogens are physiologic at a two-to-one ratio, and this is, is kept. It is available to the body for 24-7, okay, and lasts anywhere from three months to eight months at a time. It adapts to the daily needs of the body, and the difference in relief of symptoms is night and day as compared to other forms of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. As you know, Megan, the ladies come in and bless me and thank me on a regular basis. <laughs> I do know, and I'd love to take this opportunity to, uh, if anybody wants to hear some of those ladies who have blessed Dr. Harrison, thanked her, take a moment and go to our blog, the patientsmedical.com blog, and there are at least two, if not more, patients on there I'm talking about what their experience was before being balanced and then after being balanced by Dr. Harris. And Dr. Harris, you have a little bit of a story uh, yourself to tell. <laughs> yeah, do I want to tell them? <laughs> Maybe the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Now, I actually have been using this for 13 years. And it's the nurses in the operating room would literally see me coming and run. <laughs> this is before the hormones before were balanced. Before <laughs> the hormones were balanced. Okay. Once the hormones were balanced, I became a really nice person all over again. <laughs> and it's to the point where if I start 
losing the thing. If my level starts going down and I ignore it, uh, the people working with me, I remember my PA would look at me and go, Dr. H, when you get your hormones? You need your pellets. <laughs> and I would go, yeah, yeah, draw my blood. Let's, let's, you know, let's get it done. Great. So it's just that easy to just get balanced and not have to worry about all that tumultuous hormone highs and lows and ruining friendships. And Megan, <laughs> work let me tell you, it truly is <laughs> like night and day. It truly is amazing. I mean, I really am a nice person when I'm balanced. <laughs> I can attest to that. I can attest to that. Okay. Now, one of the questions that's usually asked is, what happens in terms of bioidentical hormones and cancer? And, of course, breast cancer. I'm going to talk about both. But um, we have actual studies. Um, the rate of, in general, of breast cancer in women is 7 out of 100. In other words, Seven out of every hundred women with no particular or additional exposure will get breast cancer. But when the Women's Health Initiative study was halted, there was an increase of 8%, meaning 15 out of every hundred women and on the study got breast cancer. So you more than doubled your risk with the PREMPRO or the CEE. Now, if you look at the numbers on the bottom, 7 out of 10, okay, 1,190 women, okay, when you double that, all right, got breast cancer. Look at the 2550, 7% and 8%, okay, do the math. Mm -hmm. So out of 17,000, 2,500 women. I mean, that, those numbers were staggering, okay? Those numbers were staggering. Now, when you compare that to the statistics with bioidentical hormone replacement in the same time period, okay, there were almost 1,000 women in the study. And if you were to extrapolate using the percentages from before of that 1,000 women, 70 would have normally gotten breast cancer. And of the study um, people, it would have been 150, mm -hmm. all right? There was only in the Arizona study one breast cancer out of the thousand, one. Mm -hmm. Now, doesn't it almost appear to be protective? And the statistics were not only similar to endometrial cancer, it definitely, with endometrial cancer, is protective. Wow. So just to be clear, these numbers up here are what it would have been with the WHI study. But in the Arizona study, using bioidenticals, there was only one person in the whole study. That is correct. But ended up getting breast cancer. So it also, when you compare the statistics again, is definitely cardio sparing and bone sparing. And most importantly, it does not increase dementia. Very important. Very, very important. Now, there are certain myths out there. You'll hear people say, oh, well, bioidentical is misleading. It's not. The chemical structure is exactly the same. You'll also hear people say that it has not met federal standards. That's not true. It has as far back as 1998 for the progesterone and 2004 for the estrogen, okay? You will hear them say it's unregulated. It's not true. The same state board that certifies the regular pharmacies is the state board that certifies the compounding pharmacies. And Dr. Harris, just uh, another little bit of kind of current events. So that's even being re-looked at now. Compounding pharmacies oh. are being held to even more stringent uh, and standards. And stricter standards. That is correct. 
Um, there is actually a bill in Congress right now, S959, and if you haven't yet written your congressman, you need to do so because they need to be sure that our options and our choice is not removed from us because that's the lobby, the pharmaceutical lobby, which you might or might not know is very powerful. The pharmaceutical lobby is behind this bill and they're really, because they're losing money, because people are realizing and recognizing they have options, so they are behind this bill. They want to take away the choices. Mm. So if you're interested in bioidentical hormones or any sort of compounded pharmaceuticals or you think you may be someday, tell your local elected official this uh, matters to you. Yes, absolutely. Now, very important, uh, the fact that bioidentical hormones are actually customized for each patient. And that's very, very important. With the synthetic stuff, you get a prescription, 75, 1.25, you know. And if you come back in three months and you say, oh, yeah, it helped and I'm doing fine, they write you the prescription again, 75 and 1.25. If you call up and say, oh, this is not helping, I'm still having my symptoms, they say, okay, no problem, and they go up mm. on both of them, okay. And if you say, oh, you know, this is too much, they go down, okay? So it's a hit or miss type of thing. Bioidentical hormones are custom balanced based on the individual patient. Everybody is tested and the dosing is customized, okay? Now, men, any of you out there, is there hope for you. God, I hope so. Because what is a well-balanced woman? <laughs> Without a well-balanced man. Well, I mean, there, there are many exceptions to that rule, but for some women. Now, unfortunately, fortunately, or otherwise, uh, men don't, they have the same problems, but it's not of the same magnitude or it's not recognized because of the fact that it's very, very gradual men start losing their hormones as early as the 20s. And a lot of them don't understand and realize that. Okay? It's weight gain related. It's lifestyle related. The fatigue can be debilitating. They get urinary problems. They get depressed. They get brain fog. <laughs> yeah, some of you, I'm sure, can attest to that. They get anxious. There is a decrease in the physical agility. There is definitely erectile dysfunction and decreased libido. Mm. And it's also related to the midlife crisis behavior. And it starts as early as the 20s. I had someone in here just last week, 29, with a testosterone level which was unbelievably low. And of note, his was definitely related to his lifestyle. Mm, interesting. Definitely. So these guys are suffering and they don't even realize that this may be the cause. That is correct. So we have got to replace the DHEA and the testosterone in the male if we want to help them. Now, why has my doctor not heard about this? Big answer, money. Mm. Big pharma doesn't want to lose money. And Big Pharma, as you may or may not know, controls a lot of what happens in Washington. Mm -hmm. Okay? And with your doctor, too, huh? That's correct. Most doctors only know what the drug rep tells them. Okay? We're taught in medical school what the pharmaceutical companies want us to learn. Believe I, I hate saying that, but it's true. And then when you add to that the managed care environment, it's, it's a lose, lose, lose situation, you know. Fortunately, a lot of the media is now on the bandwagon. Dr. Phil and Oprah, Dr. Oz, Susan Summers, you know, it's getting out there. It's starting to get out there. All right. So 
you know, I know that a lot of people actually, I get some calls here at Patients Medical, and women call in, or sometimes men, and they've watched the Dr. Oz show, or they read the Suzanne Summer book, or, uh, you know, whatever it is in the media that they have seen or heard, and they say, I, you know, my girlfriend tried this, she said it worked, or Suzanne's book was amazing. Where do I start? Well, first of all, you pick up the phone, you call us at Patients Medical, and you make an appointment. That's the best place to start, huh? <laughs> yes. Uh, education, obviously, is important, and that's why we're doing this webinar. Yeah, absolutely. And you would come in for a consultation. You would get evaluated. We would draw your blood so that we have the tools that are necessary, I know where you are, and we're using that along with your metabolism and your weight and a lot of other parameters, we'll know how much to give you. As I said, it's completely customized. And so, you know, everything that you just uh, mentioned there, that doesn't sound like your typical five-minute doctor office visit that most conventional doctors uh, give you. <laughs> Absolutely not. It's a comprehensive, one-hour comprehensive visit. So the one hour, is that waiting for the doctor or meeting with the doctor? <laughs> <laughs> uh, very funny. That's meeting with the doctor. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you heard your, uh, the Dr. Harris correctly. You're actually meeting with the doctor for an hour and most people think, what the heck could I discuss with the doctor in an hour? But this is what we're talking about. You're a holistic doctor really gets to know you inside and out. Yeah, and it's, it's really, really important because something you might consider insignificant might be critical to the process. Mm, absolutely. So then the blood work that you were just talking about. And then, um, so explain a little bit about how the process works, works with these implants. So we talked about orals and gels and transdermal things like that. But when an implant um, comes along, you know, how does that work for the patient that's interested in that? Okay. So what happens is you come in, you get evaluated, we draw your blood. We figure out how much of each hormone you need. And yes. In order to be balanced, 99 times out of 100, I've got to give you all the hormones, including testosterone women. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of women don't understand and realize that we actually, even as women, make testosterone as well. And that is, just as in the men, responsible for our energy and, you know, lack of fatigue and our libido and all of the above. Okay, it also is part of the cardioprotectiveness and all the rest of it. Again, good studies. So you come in and we do that. We figure out how much you need. Now the government, again, I don't know why they won't stay out of it, but they have also just changed the process in that I can't just um, say, okay, she needs this, take it off the shelf and give it to you. I have to now write what's equivalent to a narcotics prescription, send it to the compounding pharmacy, they send it to you, and then you bring it in for me to implant it in your body. And just to be clear, this is not a narcotic prescription, but it is a, a, a it's prescription. It's a controlled substance as per the government. Mm -hmm. There is nothing narcotic about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing. It's just them. another part of the whole control process with the pharmaceutical companies realizing and recognizing mm -hmm. that they are losing money and they want to make sure that they make it difficult, mm -hmm. you know, to discourage mm -hmm. people from actually taking care of themselves. But not so difficult when you're uh, with Dr. Harris because she knows exactly what to do to make the system very easy for you and for you to get your pellets as, as soon as you need to. Now, the, the next step four there says implant, which might be kind of a scary word if you didn't understand actually what's happening there. Can you shed some light? It's, it's a very, very simple procedure. Very important, but very simple procedure. It's an in-office procedure. It takes about 10 minutes. And for three days after for women, seven days after for men. Oh, yeah, I do men too. 
and it's just as important in the men. Okay, and the process is the same. Okay, so you come in and um, it's a 10 minute procedure and for three days after and for seven days after for the men, you have to what I call chill. That is not do anything strenuous, but it really starts working. We tell people within three to five days, invariably my phone rings the next day or the second day. Oh, Oh my goodness, I slept last night for the first time in three years. <laughs> you know, the testimonials are amazing. And you can go back to work after this procedure. It's not like of you have course. to be on bed rest or anything no, like no, that. No, not no. that. Type it's of a choice. procedure. It's not an operation. It's <laughs> a procedure. Are, they, are there stitches involved? No, no stitches. Mm -hmm. I put some little sticky stuff and put some stary strips over it. And that's kind of why you have to be cool for. <laughs> 48 hours, you know, yeah. so that it really will um, heal properly and won't get extruded. And these pellets that are being inserted into your uh, body, are they, are they big, are they small? They are the size of rice grains. Tiny. And they're tiny, they're put in the area of the gluteus maximus, mm -hmm. in other words, the butt muscle, uh -huh. which is the largest muscle in mm -hmm. the body. And, um, you know, once I put them in, you can't even find them. They're that small. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Innocuous. <laughs> a, a very simple procedure that makes a huge difference for a lot of people. Um, so then what is the follow-up like? Follow-up, we, since it's customized, we draw your blood to see where you are in four to six weeks. And um, if we have gotten it, hit the nail on the head, which, you know, a lot of times, you know, you use a formula, mm -hmm. but not everybody's body reads the same book. Mm -hmm. So you sometimes have to come back for a booster, but most of the time it's, it's you're in range mm -hmm. and you're now balanced. And I tell you, you will know. Mm -hmm. You, I guarantee it, you will know. Mm -hmm. I have women who will call me and say, Listen, I need to come in because you can tell. Mm -hmm. you, the difference is that dramatic mm -hmm. that you can tell. And how long, on average, would you need to wait before you have your next set of implants? You know what? There's no average. Um, it, it's anywhere from three to eight months. Well, average, six months. Okay. Pick a number. <laughs> six months. It, it, it's, it really does last. At about six months. Mm -hmm. The first time you might have to get it topped off a little sooner mm -hmm. because if you think about it and if you remember back to those graphs mm -hmm. when it starts getting used up and you start going down, if we wait for you to hit rock bottom then we will be starting all over again. What we do is when it starts going down we reimplant you and then after that it's, you know, you don't need to hit rock bottom. No. Once you're balanced, might as well just maintain and enjoy life like number seven. Okay. <laughs> that is correct. Excellent. Well, so Dr. Harris, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Any sort of uh, parting words here, words of wisdom? Well, the only, only thing that I will add to what's already been said is that we really, ladies and gentlemen, don't have to be miserable. Mm. Which is, which is what it comes down to. Our hormones, as I said initially, are responsible for many, 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 many functions in the body mm -hmm. and really should be balanced. Mm -hmm. Really should be balanced. So do yourself a favor. Get tested. Get balanced. It really is to your advantage not just in terms of how you feel, but as I pointed out in the webinar, it is important also for your physical well-being. Mm. And for those people who uh, you know, come to you and they say, what can I do to try to prevent cancer? You know, this would be one of those things along with diet and that lifestyle. You know? It's a lifestyle change and it's a part of the whole protective process. Mm. All right. Well, amen to that. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. And if you want to uh, read more about Dr. Harris and um, her patients, 
um, you can go to our uh, patient's medical blog and subscribe. Um, our most recent blog post um, at this date right now in October 2013, why Dr. Harris is pissed off about hormones. Um, and so <laughs> she talks a little bit about um, the most recent uh, news release about the WHI um, and the uh, JAMA published article earlier this week. You can also find some other information um, about uh, uh, her patients who have had great success with their hormone balance protocols. Um, one is called Relief from Hormone Imbalance Symptoms, a testimonial from Carol. Another one is a testimonial um, from another patient. Um, so I encourage you, if you're looking for more information, that's a great place to go um, to continue your discovery process. You can also check out her bio, um, uh, Marcia A. Harris. You can look on our patient's medical website, um, click on Our Physicians, this tab the second to the left, and uh, you know, search under her name and find her bio there. Look at her vast experience and her lovely picture there. And you can even buy a book um, authored by Dr. Harris, her most recent book called Reasons to Believe. That's available for purchase on our website as well. Um, so, uh, Dr. Harris is one of the many fantastic doctors that we have here at Patients Medical. Um, here are the rest of them, and you can read more about them on our website. So, um, come in and see Dr. Harris, and then also get your whole family taken care of by our doctors here at Patients Medical as well. Uh, so, you know, not everybody is ready for an appointment right now, or maybe you're outside of the New York City area, but if you are thinking that an appointment with Dr. Harris is right for you, or you want to speak with one of our patient coordinators and just get details about what it's like to be a patient here uh, with Dr. Harris, give us a call at 212-661-4441 or email media at patientsmedical.com. All of our contact information is on our website, patientsmedical.com, as well. So uh, feel free to interact with us through our website. So thank you very much, everyone. And we hope that this was informational and beneficial for you. But more than anything, look into making sure that your hormones are balanced for your own good, not just now, but for the rest of your life as well.